they care about their families, they care about their community, um, they want to leave things better than they found it for their children, they have that hope for their families, and, you know, they just want to, you know, feel like they're part of it. And I think they're, you know, quite frankly, they're some of the most patriotic Americans, you know, that you'll ever meet. You're listening to Season 2 of Seeking Refuge, a podcast about the human story behind refugees. Your host this week is me, Kevin Gagnon. If I were to ask you what the most diverse square mile in the United States was, you might be tempted to say somewhere like Manhattan or maybe Los Angeles, but it's actually in a small town on the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia, called Clarkston. Since 1993, Clarkston has been the home of over 37,000 refugees coming from all over the world. This season, we're taking a look at some of the people and organizations that help aid the town's sizable refugee populations. Our first guest, is Clarkston's mayor, Ted Terry, or Mayor Ted, as everyone around town calls him. As one of the youngest mayors in Georgia, Ted has pushed for progressive policies in a red state and embraced the populations he serves by being a strong advocate for refugee resettlement. He has also earned quite a bit of clout as being one of the stars of the second season of Netflix's Queer Eye. Currently, Mayor Ted is also running for the U.S. Senate, based on many of the policies he's pushed for during his tenure as mayor. I was able to catch up with Mayor Ted outside at Refuge Coffee, a staple for the town that is operated by refugees, where I got a chance to learn a lot more about his platforms and viewpoints on issues surrounding many of the refugee populations today. Mayor Ted, welcome to the show. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. I almost forgot about that queer eye thing. I totally forgot about it. Oh, totally. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> First, just tell me a little bit about uh, your role as mayor and um, a, a little bit about your your aspirations for Senate. Yeah, well, uh, to be really technical, the mayor in Clarkston is in a council manager form of government. So uh, the council, uh, which is made up of the mayor and six other council members, uh, set the policy for the city, and uh, we hire or fire the city manager. And the city manager is in charge of running things. So um, the mayor in Clarkston basically sits as the president of the legislative body. So a big, uh, the biggest role that I have in Clarkston is uh, is less running the city, uh, and more you know leading the vision of the city, and then you know helping craft policies that actually will help improve things in Clarkston. And so that's what I've been doing the last seven years. I'm in my seventh year now as mayor. And, you know, you learn a lot. Yeah. I mean, some of your policies have included $15 an hour minimum wage, Mm -hmm. uh, the legalization of recreational marijuana. Decriminalization. The Mm -hmm. decriminalization. Yeah, excuse me. Um, Among other things, how have those sort of policies affected the refugee populations that do live here? Well, I think, uh, you know, those policies weren't about helping refugees out. They're about just helping Clarkston residents out. Um, it just so happens that approximately half of our population is foreign born. Um, but that's, that's less, that's more about who we are. Um, how we decide to sort of like govern our society, um, is based on what is in the best interest of a hundred percent of the residents. And so, you know, Clarkston is, is like any other, uh, maybe sort of suburban kind of metropolitan area you know younger people more diverse probably a little bit more rental than you would single family housing Mm -hmm. Um, and so you have a higher density of people but you know people who are you know middle income um, or even lower income and so I think you know you have elements of those demographics coupled with people from 40 nationalities you know speaking 60 different languages um, you know, spread out over, you know, about a 40 year period. The challenge just becomes kind of logistical, you know, translating. It's about, you know, making sure there's good community connections. And it's not just about lingual, it's about cultural. And cultural just, 
you know, for us means showing up. One of the, I think, the really true honors of the mayor of Clarkston, whoever it may be, is that you get to experience and be invited and involved in um, Ramadan celebrations. The Karen New Year was just last week. The Ethiopian Day, you know, thousands of um, East Africans celebrated in, in our football stadium just down the road. You know, Lord Krishna's birthday, you know, Christmas, of course, um, the 4th of July. You know, we do, you know, it's it's sort of... Uh, maybe a few more day holidays, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but you know, I don't know. I, don't, I feel I feel like uh, Americans are, you know, really overworked, and you know, we should have a few more holidays. I think um, so. It's something you know. We were the first city in Georgia to make election day a holiday. Um, you know, so whether it's Ramadan, uh, Lord Krishna's birthday, you know, Karen New Year, Christmas, Fourth of July, or election day, you know, these holidays are ways for us to come together as a community. Last thing I'll say on that, I can go on forever, um, is I like to, I think the the quote from Mark Twain uh, when he talked about, um, you know, diversity, he was talking about, he said um, that travel is fatal to bigotry, prejudice, and narrow-mindedness, and one cannot develop broad, wholesome views of the world by vegetating in one's own corner for one's entire life. Uh, the, the bumper sticker, as I like to say, is travel is the only cure for ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> And um, in a place like Clarkston, uh, you can travel around the world and not necessarily to those sites, but to the people that ultimately come from those cultures, which I think, you know, is, um, is probably even more meaningful than maybe just, you know, going to a, you know, um, a natural scenic spot or a religious place. You know, the people are a big part of those places. And so they live here in Clarkston now and they have those experiences. And the only way that you're going to get to experience those experiences is you have to travel. (laughs) So that means some people it means overseas, others means outside their front door, you know, walking and, you know, heading towards something that's maybe new. And you get a a good opportunity to experience new things in Clarkston. And as a result, your imagination widens, your acceptance becomes more tolerable um, because you're like, wow, these people are just like you and me, Mm -hmm. you know, and, Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. they care about their families. They care about their community. Um, they want to leave things better than they found it for their children. They have that hope for their families. And, you know, they just want to, you know, feel like they're part of it. And I think they're, you know, quite frankly, they're some of the most patriotic Americans, you know, that you'll ever meet. Um, oh. People who really, you know, quite frankly, have been rejected and, and forced to flee their home because of who they are, or who they love, or what, you know, background they're from. And so they, they've lost that home. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the least we could do is try to provide a new home for a small, you know, a small sliver. You know, if, 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 if any, just a small sliver. Um, and now we're down to like the smallest sliver <laughs> yeah. uh, in the last 40 years of refugee resettlement. So, you know, it's something that's, that's exciting. It's good in Clarkston. It's also uh, at threat um, because the Trump administration and Governor Brian Kemp, you know, right now they haven't said whether they're going to allow refugees to come to Georgia uh, mm-hmm. in this next this next year. So that was something I was going to bring up too was um, Governor Kemp's reluctance to you know write the letter either pro or against. Like keeps fence sitting from the last thing that I saw. What's your general message to legislators or you know anyone that may be wary of allowing refugees? Yeah, well, look, I mean, the I wouldn't characterize Governor Kemp's position on refugee resettlement in Georgia as uh, reluctance. I would just take it as, you know, as due process. He's reviewing the the information and the facts. I think uh, January 17th is like sort of the deadline. Um, but, you know, you, you get it done before the deadline, you got it done. And that's the important thing. Um, you know, in the meantime, uh, I think we just have to look at what the evidence says. The evidence shows that, you know, refugees in the first 180 days in Georgia have a 91% self-sufficiency rates, which means they're, they have a job, you know, they're accumulating income, they're um, gaining credit, you know, they're doing, they're orientating through the, with the help of groups like um, New American Pathways, International Rescue Committee, uh, the Friends of Refugees, um, Clarkson High School, uh, Georgia State, you know, all of these community groups, you know, are sort of, you know, part of that. Um, and uh, this the local economy, the state of a uh, Georgia's economy benefits from refugees. You know, it's a ready and willing workforce, 
hard workers, um, people who do not commit, you know, crimes. I mean, some of the lowest, you know, statistical, you know, crime rates of all, you know, not just Americans and but immigrants. And so, it's it's a real win-win for the country. It's a foreign policy uh, strategy to show that the hearts and minds of the persecuted peoples of the world are being thought after by the most powerful nation on earth, the wealthiest nation on earth, you know, can afford, and a country as large as ours, <laughs> can afford to try to relieve the suffering of what, you know, is approximately 25 million people are considered refugees. Mm -hmm. And that's just based on that persecution uh, definition. Um, but taking into account asylum seeking and climate refugees, I mean, you're looking into just the, you know, 20, 30s of millions of people. And so, you know, like, we all have to do our parts. And if, if we're not leading, the rest of the world, you know, might not be willing or able to follow that. And so that just creates more human suffering. So, you know, we're, we're just trying to tell the facts about it. I think everyone who looks at the evidence and sees out the benefit that refugees are to Georgia, you know, they'd say, yeah, we have to continue it. Ohio, uh, Missouri, I think. Other Democrat and Republican states have all said, yeah, refugees per settlement should continue. It is a positive thing for our community. It's interesting that you bring up the idea of like a, a, a climate refugee. Yeah. Because as we see the effects of climate change worsen uh, in the coming years, that's obviously going to, only going to increase. As the definition of refugee changes in that way, how do you think legislation should change on refugee statuses in general? Well, climate refugees still aren't legally de defined as refugees. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that it's going to have to be addressed. It's just becoming more exacerbated. I mean, if you, if you consider... Australia, for instance. Um, so being a climate refugee in Australia doesn't mean going from Australia to another country. It's, you know, it's just going to some other part of Australia. The next climate, you know, wildfire um, might be in, you know, the Congo. And then all of a sudden you have 10 million people living in parts of Central Africa. They're now in other countries. And these are countries that have been at war with each other. You know, that those are basically the makings for not just refugees, but also for wars, which, you know, if you really want, you know, wars really cause refugees. And so, you know, when you talk about climate refugees, I mean, it, re it easily intersects into climate disruption caused these mass movements, which caused resource strain, which caused countries and leaders of countries to go to war with each other over those strained resources or over those, you know, past, you know, issues. And so climate change, refugees, war refugees, I mean, it kind of, it all is in one stream that's adding to the other 25 million that are already considered refugees. And so it's just, you know, it's something we have to be proactive about. In Clarkston, we're trying to do our part. You know, we've, we've begun planning for our 100% clean energy future. Uh, we don't have all the details on it because it's it's complicated it's, it's only so much that we can do in Clarkston um, we're doing um, a big program over the next three years to provide uh, weatherization and energy efficiency upgrades for um, fixed income residents so particularly you know older you know residents who are on fixed income social security who live in homes whose power bills go up every year and if we can do energy efficiency, if we can do even some solar on their homes, you know, we can reduce their utility energy burden, you know, a lot more, which, you know, in parts of Atlanta, we got a really high energy burden. And that becomes a problem because that squeezes out the things that actually are really important. So we're trying to do more energy efficiency here, but, you know, we're going to need a, a state and federal response to climate change. Um, we, we need more, like if Clarkson had more support to deploy solar and to invest in energy efficiency, you know, we would take that. If that was like a, a federal grant out there, Clarkson would apply for that in a heartbeat. And we could put, you know, we estimate 500 people to work, like people who would, would happily work in Clarkston, work a living wage job, retrofitting all of the building, residential, commercial, and industrial building stock in Clarkston. It's not that much, it's 1.4 square miles. Um, and then the added result of having, you know, three to five years of work for these, you know, 500 people turn, you know, working in the community they, they live in turns into, um, you know, child care rates go up because parents are home earlier. You know, if parents are home earlier and are 
interacting with their children more and being more in, communi- com- in the community with the children, those children's test scores go up, their graduation grades go up, and then all of a sudden you've got a critical mass of young people who, you know, are going or who are basically advancing, um, you know, beyond where maybe they came from and are getting that opportunity to get educated, to find a good way of life. And, uh, you know, so it's like a Green New Deal's help is dealing with climate change, but it's also creating um, opportunities in a community, even as small as Clarkston, to actually have more community. And the more, and again, this is the theme of Clarkston, you know, travel is the only cure for ignorance. You know, you have to be willing to go up to your comfort zone and then, you know, just step one foot forward, you know, out, outside of it. <laughs> yeah. And if that's all you can do, just stop right there. But if you feel like you want to keep going. And so, um, you know, we got it like, like the idea of community can only get more enhanced, can only get more, um, I think, a part of, you know, how we live our lives. Have you had a lot of pushback on the, you know, the growth of the, the refugee populations here in Clarkston? You know, Clarkston, for at least the last decade, has been known as a very diverse community. And I think that it would be, it would be very hard-pressed for that dynamic to change. You know, Clarkston started out as a, a railroad town, mostly white, um, became more diverse with African Americans who lived closer in Atlanta but were moving out. And then folks just kept moving out. And so then you had a lot of vacancies and refugees kind of filled in a lot of those sort of, you know, you know affordable housing opportunities. Um, so, you know, some people who don't like refugees, you know, that I've encountered, you know, they moved. They're just like, you know what, I've had it. I don't want to be around this. The people that move and replace them, you know, might come from the community, uh, a renter to a home. You know, I've got a very diverse neighborhood of single family homes, <laughs> you know, um, who, uh, you know, just same, looking for the same thing we're looking for. Um, um, but they, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes neighbors don't get along. What can I, what can I say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they, they, they move on. Sometimes they figure it out. Sometimes it's still kind of similar. So, yeah, you know, I mean, you're never, never going to please everybody. And, you know, we got we have our issues um, where people kind of don't see kind of eye to eye. But, uh, you know, thankfully that doesn't, like, mean violence. It just means, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like being in a around some people who are just like extra passive aggressive. Yeah, (laughs) makes sense. You know, so uh, if that's the the worst it it turns into, you know, I'll take it. That's not okay. It's not a big deal. (laughs) So you co, correct me if I'm wrong, but you co-signed a letter calling out President Donald Trump on his reduction of the amount of refugees we're admitting every year. Mm. If that were to be reversed, (laughs) what would be your next steps as far as helping refugees when they are settled here? Well, I think the program is, has been working just fine. You know, it's 91% self-sufficiency rates. I mean, the purpose of the refugee resettlement program is that it's the, uh, it's the proverbial, you know, swimming pool, you know, or body of water where you start out in the shallow end and you just kind of keep working your way to the, the deep end. And the deep end, you're expected to be able to swim on your own. You know, right. if you have to grab on to, you know, to someone, they might, you might pull them down with you. And so, you know, the basic concept is, you know, it's, you know, teach a person to fish, (laughs) you know, then they'll, you know, eat for a lifetime. Um, So, you know, there's certainly, there's a lot of like kind of triage charity where it's like, you know, um, the support we get from the community for clothing donations and furniture donations and, and like stocking the pantries of food and school supplies and, you know, bicycles for the kids, um, you know, job opportunities for the parents. Um, All those things, you know, uh, happen kind of as a community. And, you know, it's worked really well in Georgia. So we should just keep doing what we've been doing. Speaking towards education, um, Mm -hmm. oftentimes kids coming here as refugees can have a hard time matriculating into schools based on either English language programs or maybe funding for that sort of stuff. Is that maybe a problem that could be solved through legislation or do you think that should stay at the purview of, you know, the local charity model that we see here? 
Well, let me, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have uh, Indian Creek Elementary School. It's the ele- one, of, one of our two elementary schools in Clarkston. And mm-hmm. we're part of the DeKalb County School System, so we have no policy control over the schools, naturally. Um, Indian Creek Elementary School, um, about a decade ago, was, was considered one of the lowest performing schools. Um, you know, high refugee population. Um, in recent years, we've spent a lot of time developing more early childhood education opportunities and programs and after school programs and, and sort of wrap around supports. Um, and, you know, as a result of that and in particular an apartment complex that began offering free after school <laughs> for all of their kids, it was like a hundred kids went to where next, it was an apartment complex, Willow Branch right next door to Indian Creek Elementary. Um, And so a lot of kids would just walk to the school. Um, That program for those children, you know, meant that every single one of those children, like they didn't get held back, right? And that's an issue that you kind of get into with um, some young people of interrupted education where maybe they started school in you know, third grade in their home country, but war and refugee status can go on for five, six, seven, eight years. And so the last time they were in school was, you know, five years ago or seven years ago. And so they have to kind of be put into a situation that might not fit. And so, you know, flexibility in education, I think, you know, DeKalb County Schools, I think have done a really good job, quite frankly, of creating that that sort of variancy where depending on where, what level you're at, you get placed into the right situation. Um, but I think the, the core principle we've learned is that it can't just be the, ed- the Board of Education's problem, you know, challenge. It's the whole community's challenge. And I think call to provide, you know, exceptional education for any of the residents. And to me, that is, it's, you know, it's all, it's evidence-based policymaking. <laughs> it is, you know, early childhood education, mm-hmm. you know, it's pre-K and 3K. You know, this is something that, you know, wealthier families have enough money to afford. Middle income and certainly people living near the poverty line absolutely cannot afford that kind of stuff. And it is the true equalizer when you put money into education, when you do two hours of after schooling, uh, when you look at the income gaps in terms of low income and high income children, the performance rates, they, they meet when they're given those two extra hours after school. So, you know, dollar for dollar is the best investment we can make. And so my, you know, bigger vision, you know, for Clarkston, and, you know, this is something that I think you know, becomes actually a national issue is what is our government, what is our society's role in educating our young people, the people who will be our future leaders? And I don't think we're putting our money where our mouth is. I think we talk about how we care about it, but we, we bifurcate it, we make education kind of over here, and we should be finding ways to to bring that part of our government, the education part of our government, into all the other sectors. How has leading such a diverse community affected or influenced your both political outlook as a leader and a politician. Well, it's just, I mean, it's just the opportunity to, I said, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, travel, <laughs> yeah. you know, to have experiences that you, you know, if I, if I wasn't in this role, um, the experiences I had over the last seven years, you know, wouldn't you know, have happened. And I think that, um, finding opportunities to, again, to sort of expand your horizons and to try to experience new things, you know, at your own pace, all right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, if, you know, it's, it's something that's just, you know, allowed me to understand a lot more about uh, people, about humanity, about certainly about religions and cultures, but to ultimately get back to, again, the original sort of idea that, you know, we're, we're all, you know, basically the same, you know, like we're human beings, <laughs> you know, our identity, our culture, you know, um, you know, should never tell us that we have to look poorly or disdain or hate or want to fight, you know, and kill, you know, our own, you know, fellow human beings. So, uh, you know, that just, it's made me a more, you know, compassionate person. And it's made me a more person who says that we should avoid war at all costs, that we should be investing in the, the things that will, you know, you know, have I think have and will even more so um, create a more peaceful world. What are you running for, and what is like your main platform? I'm running for the United States Senate here in Georgia. It's for the seat that is currently held by Republican David Perdue. 
I'm running to bring courage back to Washington. <laughs> I'm a big believer. I always tell people, don't tell me what you believe, show me what you've done, and then right. I'll tell you what you believe. And my record as mayor of Clarkston, the things that we have fought for and that we've been you know, advocating and trying to lead by example on, those are the things that, you know, one, people know that I care about because I've spent a lot of time and energy trying to make them happen. And so I want to do that for Georgia um, in the Senate. And, you know, that's, I've got, that's my progressive records. Um, and I think if you look at my record and look at what I've done and see the kind of person I am, um, I think that people hopefully will um, be glad that they have a, a small town mayor fighting for them in the U.S. Senate. Folks can go to tedforgeorgia.com, T-E-D-F-O-R, Georgia spelled out, dot com, or just Google Ted Terry. I'm on Instagram, Ted Terry one on Twitter, Instagram, and Ted for Georgia on Facebook, if anyone does Facebook anymore. Do people still do Facebook? I think so. Okay. Um, I'm definitely on the gram, Ted Terry one and I'm trying to figure out how to do TikTok. But it's beyond us. Still working on it. It's out of but our... I will. I will figure it out one of these days. Um, so yeah, it'd be great. And if anyone has any questions, my my platforms up there, my contact information. Anyone can message me. Social media. You know, we can. We'll we'll, we'll get back to you. Awesome. Well, Mayor Ted, thank you so much for your time and be, and being on the show. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, and thanks for visiting Clarkston, Georgia. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to the first episode of our brand new season of Seeking Refuge. We have a lot more stories that we can't wait to share with you. Also, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Refuge Podcast to get the latest news about the show. Huge thanks to Max International House for making this show possible and for Mayor Ted Terry for taking the time to talk with us. Our next episode is two weeks away. However, feel free to go and listen to any of the episodes from our first season. We'll think you'll like them.